If I asked you to picture a Wes Anderson film, you could probably think about his use of bright colour palettes, perfect symmetry, tracking shots, or even the quirky dialogue that is scattered throughout his catalogue of films. <laughs> Look at your girlfriend stab me in the back with lefty scissors. In this essay film, I want to focus on Anderson's distinct aesthetics, looking closely at his use of framing and colour, as well as examining how Jean-Luc Godard has influenced his works by comparing and contrasting the two, asking, could Wes Anderson be considered a radical and challenging filmmaker, just as Godard is? Jean-Luc Godard played a major role in the French New Wave, starting out as a critic who discussed the future of French cinema, and then went on to put these theories into practice. Though for Godard, cinema was more than a personal means of expression. It was a principal means of culture formation. The French New Wave is considered one of the most significant film movements in the history of cinema that encouraged new styles, themes, and modes of production throughout the world. The collective filmmakers have had a global impact on cinema, especially the idea of creating something that is personal, encouraging artistic freedom, and breaking away from the constraints of a typical studio production. Chapter 1. Framing and Jump Cuts Wes Anderson often uses symmetry and framing by centering characters and landscapes, creating visually appealing screen design and points of focus that our eyes are instantly drawn to. This technique, as Lee states, is noticeable. It's arranged perfectly to draw attention to specific details. When watching Goddard's films, particularly Piero Le Fou, which was a significant influence on Anderson's film, Moonrise Kingdom, Goddard used symmetry frequently, what Bordwell would refer to as planometric shots. Goddard used flat backgrounds and played with space using abstract technique to create visually iconic aesthetics, and it could be said that this inspired Anderson. Anderson demonstrates a visual style that is consistent in his films, the primary characteristics being frame tableaus, most likely presented in the form of symmetry. In Anderson's second film, Rushmore, tableaus were used to show all of Max Fisher's extracurricular activities. They were choreographed and exaggerated to the extent that the audience would instantly notice this as intentional. Bordwell highlights Anderson's choices in creating what feels like an artwork. Everything is perfectly placed, using layers to create an interesting image as opposed to just lining the characters up. In doing this, the audience are aware that it's a conscious decision. Each and every person has been placed in a way that is obvious to a spectator. Anderson's films often do portray a theatrical aesthetic. For him, it seems more about creating an artwork, favouring artistic design over similar narratives and the overall elements of the story. Though Anderson may have been influenced in some way by Goddard's approaches and framing, especially using planometric shots, they still have their own distinct framing style. Anderson rarely strays from symmetry, and he's adopted it as a focal point in his imagery. But Goddard's framing feels very authentic, driven by character. In Breathless, unique framing was used to take on the perspective of Michelle looking at Patricia. One of Goddard's most innovative choices in filmmaking was the use of jump cut. Writer David Sterrett states that Goddard and his colleagues were fascinated with Hollywood and American popular culture. Goddard's Breathless was heavily inspired by 1930s and 40s Hollywood cinema, and he moulded the characters and plot around such. What made Goddard so innovative was the choice to break the rules of traditional editing. Editing beforehand was supposed to be fluid and invisible, but Goddard's use of jump cut draws attention to the cuts and gives the film a jagged energy. This is similar to Anderson, the audience are aware that they're watching a film. Goddard essentially challenged both commercial narrative cinema norms and film criticism vocabulary by creating a different style of editing and filmmaking that is still used in cinema. It could be said that Goddard inspired Anderson to utilise the jump cut, as he has experimented with its uses in many of his own films. Anderson uses the jump cut for different reasons, as a stylistic choice for comedic timing or creating climactic emotional moments in the passing of time. In doing this, Anderson furthers his distinct style, but I wouldn't consider him radical for this, because the jump cut is used frequently, and when Goddard did it, it was considered a new mode of editing. Chapter 2. Colour Another one of Anderson's most defining aesthetics are his choices of colour palette, and often how this is implemented into a visually striking screen design in costumes and sets. His colour schemes are distinctive. As May Shark points out, red and yellows are a recurring colour within his films. Colour represents a form of personal meaning. He often uses colour as memories and nostalgia, which are a central point in his films. But Anderson has also used pastel colours before. In Grand Budapest Hotel, lots of pastel pink and blues occupy the screen, which he uses to reflect the filmic reality in which the characters and plot exist. Anderson employs colour and uses it effectively to inspire certain emotion and thoughts within a frame to an audience. Every film he has made has a stylized colour scheme that is specific to that world. 
These characteristics are what make Anderson such a unique director, as his films are visually stunning and feel more of an artwork than just entertainment. Through watching Goddard's work, Piero Lefou and Contempt, I noticed bright red, yellows and blues that were immediate and captivating. Goddard was heavily inspired by 1950s Hollywood musicals and contemporary pop culture. As Newport states, many of the new wave filmmakers took these daring colour strategies, but used them to create personal aesthetics for the reflection of themes and representation. Goddard uses colour in a way that creates emotional significance, associating certain colours with narrative elements. He used recurring colours, just as Anderson does, that distinguishes a character in environments. In Pierre Le Fou, Goddard used mainly reds and blues. I think red especially seemed to represent the main character's desire for adventure and breaking away from his mundane life. Both Goddard and Anderson are similar in creating bold colour blending and matches, from Goddard's reds and blues and Anderson's deep yellow and pastel pink. They both use eye-catching colours that stick in our mind as we watch. And maybe for the same reasons, Goddard used the colours to scream out the radical themes and storytelling, often set in boring, mundane urban life. In a way, this is very similar to Anderson. In The Royal Tenenbaums, the narrative is really about dysfunctional families, which many can relate to and can be considered mundane urban life, but it's filled with colour, clothing in reds and deep brown. This stands out to the spectator, it's elaborate and engaging. For Anderson, colour is used to create a unique filmic world, but Goddard is considered iconic for aesthetics and often portray a deeper meaning that stretches far beyond the film. Chapter 3 reflections in my own film. Just as Anderson may have been inspired by techniques Jean-Luc Godard incorporated, I made a short film demonstrating the influences of both Anderson and Godard. I experimented with some of the different techniques to help further my development and practice, but also to reflect on what I had learned. I attempted symmetrical framing, with the idea of creating points of focus to draw the viewer in. The character stares directly into the camera, breaking the fourth wall. This is something that both Godard and Anderson do that blurs the lines of realism and narrative. It was difficult to get every frame accurate, furthering the fact that Anderson is extremely concise in his framing when constructing an image. Another technique I experimented with was isolated shots and jump cuts that I noticed in Godard's Breathless. I wanted to create the jagged energy and awareness, but also building a full picture from single images. Colour didn't play a major part in the test, but I thought about how colour can represent a character's desires. The character's bright red and blue jumper contrasts the surroundings that are quite dreary. I was interested in using the singular colours as an engaging feature. It was an exercise in finding a reason to make certain stylistic choices for thematic purposes. To answer whether I think Anderson is a radical filmmaker, I'd say that he isn't. He hasn't impacted cinema quite like Goddard has. Goddard was innovative in a time where narrative editing and rules were rarely broken, and used films to comment and critique politics at the time, whereas Anderson's films are more about dysfunctional families and the relationships. Goddard and Anderson are very similar in their focus on style and visuals, and though I don't think Anderson is radical for his social commentary or creation of new technique, I do think he has a unique vision. He has a stylized format, which he demonstrates through distinct aesthetics and symmetry in colour, making him instantly recognisable. 